Well, welcome to uh, this workshop uh, of the uh, Asian Language Resources. It's held as part of the IJC NLP, International Joint Conference of NLP. That was held in uh, Chiang Mai in November 2011. This talk is entitled uh, Linguist Assistant, a Resource for Linguists. And uh, what, exa what exactly is it a resource for? Well, it's a resource for two things in particular, for documenting endangered languages and for translation via document authoring. We'll discuss what document authoring means uh, here in just a minute. Uh, this paper in particular used an example uh, from the masculine language inalienable possession uh, to point out some of the abilities of the linguist system uh, program. For, for this talk, the main thing I'm going to do is do an introduction to LA uh, with a little bit at the end showing how this example and, an, and another example in Thai can, uh, how we can use LA to implement them. And uh, I'm Steve Beal, and my uh, my co-author and uh, co-developer uh, and designer and uh, an actual programmer of LA is Todd Allman at the University of Texas. So we started off saying there's two things. There's documenting endangered languages, and there's translation verse, uh, via document authoring. So what is this endangered languages all about? It's actually a big focus now in uh, linguistic circles, at least in, uh, in a uh, practical uh, field-based linguist. Uh, it's, a, it's a big focus, uh, which happily uh, corresponds to some money, grants. I'm in the, what I'm hoping are the last stages of, of getting a grant from the NSF in, in the U.S. in this program called Documenting Endangered Languages to use LA in Vanuatu for several languages there. And there are other governments and other agencies also. I know I've had uh, discussions here at the, uh, at, the, at the conference with uh, people from the Philippines, and uh, there is a lot of work going on, a lot of interest uh, going on in documenting some of the more than uh, is it 150 or 170 languages in that country, many of which are becoming extinct. So what do we mean by that? Well, there are 6,000 languages in the world. Thousands of them are going to be extinct, meaning that they won't have any people who speak them in the next 10 to 20 years. And this process is accelerating. Uh, it's caused, of course, by the encroaching national languages on them. Among That's the main, main cause of this. It results in, in loss of linguistic knowledge. Now, you know, here at the NLP conference, we think that we know uh, most, if not everything, about, about what can happen in a language. But that's not true. There are... Of these languages, many of them have little or no documentation, so we just don't know what, what is going on in those. And of course, more importantly, at a personal level, there's this the loss of culture in, in all of these languages. Uh, a loss of a language corresponds pretty much directly to loss of a culture. For example, in my work back in the 90s, I worked in the northeast part of Thailand with this language called Sac. Uh, and uh, that language, even at that time, there were only a, a few older people who spoke the language, and that, that community had just been assimilated into Northeast Thai. You, know, you could drive through Northeast Thai and see village after village, and, and you couldn't really tell that this one was... Uh, uh, that you couldn't see anything distinctively sack about it, which I think to them is a, is a shame. Another example of, of an endangered language and of different cause was in Vanuatu, where I worked, uh, there was a language, a thriving language, uh, that was wiped, pretty much wiped out by a hurricane in the 70s. So there's only, I think, about 10 people now who uh, uh, speak this language. And uh, uh, hopefully that will be the focus of, one of, of, of some of the work that I'm going to do in this grant. All right, so then the other thing, we have documenting endangered languages and then translation. They sort of go hand in hand with L.A., you can't do one without at least a little bit of the other. But we do have some projects that focus on translation, and uh, I wanted to just to introduce uh, LAs and how you use in a translation. We have to make sure we're on the same page, and that's where this thing called document authoring comes in. Uh, there's two main ways to do uh, translation, uh, machine translation. Uh, first way is you start from the source text, and in some way, analyze that and get to the target text. Now there are some, there are various ways to do that. 
there's a transfer base, there's interlingual approach where you go through an intermediary, but all, all of them start from the source text in some way. And the bottom line is that that's just too difficult. Uh, the ambiguity uh, is just uh, too high. The source text analysis, of however you do it, is extremely difficult and unreliable for all but the for all but the most um, all but the most uh, well funded and well researched language. And for the, the things that we're talking about, the language kind of languages we're talking about, it's completely unrealistic. So document authoring then involves pre-analyzing the source texts into an unambiguous representation. And what we'll do is, is when we get to the translation stage, we will be using pre-analyzed, unambiguous representations to do the translation from. And uh, that then is just a text generation uh, 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 task, which although Obviously, it's not easy. It is definitely state-of-the-art today to be able to do that and to do that job well. Uh, here, this slide is just talking a little bit about what I mean by this, this unambiguous representation. Uh, uh, and I, I do say that it is a decidedly lower goal than a general purpose semantic representation. And so you can look here. This at an extremely high level is what our unambiguous representations look like. It's some sort of structural uh, uh, representation. And here are disambiguated English word senses. Uh, for the most part, we use English word senses. And then on top of that, we have a system of semantic features that add to the conceptual model of a sentence uh, in ways that uh, are able to specify the semantics to the level that we need to be able to do those two things we're interested in, to document the language and to produce quality translations. Uh, uh, and, you know, we have, uh, we have a, a visual representation of this. We have a, a, uh, a document authoring uh, system that allows us to fairly uh, quickly and semi-automatically produce semantic representations like this. So that's the, the Top level introduction. Uh, now, as far as linguist assistant, how do we go about achieving language description and the translation goals? Well, we start off with this big blue box here, and into it we put an elicitation corpus. These are English sentences that are meant to exemplify all of the different uh, uh, types of meaning that we are have modeled, that we are interested in and ever being able to translate. Uh, so for instance, uh, we might, and we divide this elicitation corpus into groups of sentences. So we might have a group of sentences here, like the man hit the building, the man should hit the building, the man might hit the building. These are different kinds of semantic modalities that are changing. We might down here have a group of sentences that look at spatial proximity. So this man, like the one next to me, uh, hit the building. This man, the one, next to both of us, or that man, the one next to you, that one, the, the remote one. And these are all just changing slightly uh, one semantic feature, and they're exemplifying those. And so we have this, and again, this is meant to exemplify everything in our semantics. Uh, so what we do is we send that out with the linguist, uh, wherever, to, the, you know, to, to work with a uh, target language native speaker, and we get translations for all of those. And so in one way, if you think about it, well, that is a language description. Here's everything we want to be able to say, and here's how you say it in the language. But we want to go much further than that. We want to get a computational description, first of all, and we want to get one that's somewhat explanatory in a linguistic grammatical sense. And so uh, to help that process out, we have used our document authoring system to take all of these English sentences that exemplify everything we want to say, and we've made semantic representations from them. And so now think about what you could do. In this, in semantic representations for these sentences, these, this is the man hit the building, should hit the building, might hit the building. Uh, we've designed the corpus so that only one thing, or, or at the very least, a very small number of things are changing semantically. So in these, this case, 
uh, with these modalities, there's just one feature changing. It's the semantic modality. And so the computer could look and say, oh, well, the difference between this sentence and that sentence is just this, this one feature changed the value. Then it could look over here in the target translations and see, well, what happened here? Uh, they added a word or they added an affix uh, or maybe they changed a word order or some combination of all of those. And you can see then how you might be able to pull out a rule. Here's uh, this sentence is adding this this uh, semantic feature, and here's how you implement it in the language. Well, at a very high level, that's that's what this is all about. Uh, we're pulling out these rules, how to implement each of these semantic features or constructs, how you do it in, in these languages. And if you do that for all of this, these sentences here, all the way down the line, you get a language description. Uh, this is a computational description made up of all these rules. And once you have this, you have a computational description that should be able to answer in here anything over here. How do you do this? How do you do, uh, do I should say, over in this column, semantic representation, how do you implement this semantic feature or this semantic construct in this language? And you'll have a rule or rules that will show you how to do it. Now, uh, this process I described is not one that can be done completely automatically, although we are working on making it easier and easier. Uh, so what LA now, part, a big part of it is this visual rule interface that allows the, the user to do this process in a visual environment uh, in, in a way that a lot of times the rules can be set up by the context of the inputs uh, and it allows you to uh, relatively easily, easily produce the, then the outputs, the target translations and the target structures that, uh, are the outputs of these rules. Of course, that's not the end of it. We have this is this is the first thing we want. We want to be able to do language descriptions. The second thing is we want to be able to do translations, and they do go hand in hand in LA. And so we can take this language description, take an author text. These are any kind of texts. We have, uh, uh, for instance, we have uh, several medical texts there. We work with uh, Bible translation people. Uh, these texts can be self-authored. So anything that that's of interest uh, can be authored, put into the semantic representation, use our built-in text generation engine with a language description to produce translations. All right, so this I, I know very well that this is very that this is impossible to see, but I just wanted to give you a, a, an overview, a very visual, uh, high-level visual overview. Uh, up here, this is the semantic representation. Uh, related stuff. Here is the here is a visual representation of the semantic representations. You can do mouse overs. So, for instance, you can mouse over a concept, and this box will pop up, and it'll show you the ontology, or, or it'll show you what it'll show you what the concept is and its definition, and you can link then into the ontology and see its place in the ontology. Uh, if you mouse over uh, features here, you can get a description of all the semantic features that are used in the, in the language. Uh, and then down here, these are all just types of visual rules. Uh, there's a way, there's a lexicon interface and being able to build lexical rules using lexical features. Uh, you can generate affixes, uh, do phrase structure ordering. You can do some sort of uh, more uh, deep, deeper rules uh, that we call restructuring uh, type of rules. Uh, and uh, uh, then, you know, using all these and more, uh, you can produce outputs. And we have a, 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 an interface that helps you uh, process and debug outputs. You can mouse over things, see what rules were applied, uh, and then you can click on those rules and go to them automatically. Uh, you can set breakpoints and things like that. So this this is at a very high level what uh, LA looks like from a practical point of view. And before I go on to the to uh, the example that we're going to use, I just wanted to summarize and sort of argue for uh, LA. Why do we think that it works? And uh, one of the main arguments we can make is that the translation capability that we have shown and documented demonstrates two things. First of all, it demonstrates the accuracy and coverage of linguistic descriptions that are produced. If you can produce good translations, they must be good underlying uh, linguistic description of those languages. And then secondly, uh, we argue that it argues uh, for the suitability of the whole methodology, the language uh, language description methodology 
that we are employing. So we have done experiments. We've produced high quality first draft translations in a number of languages. And the important thing is these languages are wildly different, uh, different kinds of language families. Uh, uh, from Dr. Allman's uh, dissertation, we've shown that product productivity is typically quadrupled on the part of a translator. As a, so a translator using LA as opposed to one doing it by hand without any loss of quality. We've done comprehension testing where we've taken translations produced by a trained human linguist uh, and translations produced by LA and gone out into the village situation and done comprehension testing and shown that they have essentially the same point, that the same uh, semantic content, content. So again, the point, high quality translation is an argument that the underlying semantic representations of these languages that we've used uh, is, are, are also high quality. Now, uh, uh, this is uh, going to be a very short uh, description of this process and how you can use LA in it. It is more or less a teaser for you to read the paper that's in the, the Asian language resource uh, proceedings. Uh, but uh, here, here's a quick view of the phenomena in uh, masculines. They have, uh, along with most if not all languages in that area of the world, they have a distinction between nouns that can be alienable, alienably possessed and inalienably possessed. So, for instance, your arm. You can't get rid of your arm. It's yours whether you want it or not. Same thing with your mother. I mean, everybody loves their mother, but even if you wanted to, you couldn't get rid of your mother. She's your mother. As opposed to something like your book. I mean, that's not something that is inherently yours. And so, these languages make a distinction in how they treat those. So, uh, I got to breeze through some of this and uh, um, uh, and kind of skip over a few things. But in, at the highest level, there's a couple different ways that our things get treated. So, for instance, for directly possessed inalienable things like my mother. So here's the word for mother, na, and you put on the possessive pronoun directly onto it. And for one thing, it's required. You have to have that. You can't just have the word mother by itself. Uh, I, I think you probably can in some strange way, because you have to be able to talk about mothers. But in normal speech, you have it's required. You have to put whose mother, and you do it by putting it directly on there. And there's some other examples. Uh, uh, the, this, this is how you do it. If, if the, the possessor is, uh, you can use a pronoun. So anything that's first or second person or a third person pronoun, like his mother. If it's, if it's the possessor has to be specified, like the man's mother, you can't use a pronoun for man, then this is how you do it. You uh, put on a, um, you have to add, first of all, you add uh, the, the, the third, the, like if it was the man's mother, you have to still add the third person pronoun there, and then you put uh, the, the person or whatever it is that's the possessor. Uh, there, just following it. So the key is that you, in all cases, you use this this pronoun. Now let's just skip over to the other side for the alienable things. Uh, there's two ways to do it. First of all, if the if the possessor is a pronoun, no longer do you put the pronoun directly onto the noun. That's the main difference between alienable and inalienable. You cannot put it right on. You have to have this uh, a personal or possessive pronoun right here that uh, says this is the my. And this is the pig over here. And then uh, if the, the, the thing that is possessing it is not a pronoun, uh, then you do something different. You have a noun here and you put this uh, proclitic before it to indicate uh, uh, that there is possession going on. And on top of all that, laid on top of that, there are of these alienable nouns, there are H class nouns and S class nouns that is inherent to the lexical word. So some words are in there, some words are in here, and you use different uh, pronouns or clitics, depending on that. And then just going back, uh, one more thing uh, is that depending on if uh, this thing is a human or not human, uh, uh, depends a little bit on, uh, it, it, it shows up in the nominalizer. So here's human nominalizers here, and here's non-human nominalizers. But that's sort of a general thing, not completely specific to 
this ailing in the animal thing. Well, that's very high level uh, uh, look at it. The point is that it's a, it's a phenomena that's well, it's understandable, especially if I had a few more minutes to explain it. But it, you know, it's relatively complex, and uh, you know, it's based on lexicon classes, uh, and uh, you know, it has some rules associated with it. Well, so how do we use LA to do it? To, to document this. Well, one of the things, one of the main points of this paper is, is uh, that in addition to this pre-existing elicitation corpus that we have uh, that is used to guide the linguist through the language documentation process, we completely understand that there are some things that we can't predict, that we can't have in this pre-existing uh, corpus. So, for instance, we can't predict that a language is going to have a, a different class for certain words than, than certain other words. So we can't predict that certain words are going to be alienable and inalienable and treated differently. And so we allow you to use the document author to construct new examples. So here we have these these uh, 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 amount to my mother, your mother, our mother. Uh, I mean, you can see here that it's, uh, yeah, the first person here and uh, etc. That's all I'm showing here. But there's a whole bunch of these sentences that are examples for this phenomena. And so that's how you do it. You, you have a phenomena that's language specific. You generate a bunch of examples using our document authoring system. Uh, uh, well, you don't generate them. You create the semantic representation of them using our document authoring system. So you have that. And now that's going to be the basis, the starting point for helping you to write the rules. And so very quickly, then you can write lexicons that use that that define different classes. So each one of these words uh, have a different class. Uh, you can say sorry. You can say whether they're human or not. So that's just another kind of class. Then you can just write the rules. So here, for instance, this one down here is the main one. This is the one that generates the possessive pronouns that are used for inalienable directly possessed nouns. Um, and so you can see over here, it says you can add the, the rows are the number, uh, I mean, are the, the person over here is the number and it produces the correct thing. And uh, you can also specify, and this would take a little bit to get into, but you can specify uh, the exact target uh, defined feature uh, of when you want to use this rule. Uh, and there are other rules. There are rules then uh, uh, to set target uh, target language specific uh, features that you've created to help in these kinds of rules. Uh, and there are you know there are various other kinds of rules that uh, that we'd love to be able to get into to show you uh, when we had more time. Using then those rules, uh, you can use our built uh, in text generator to generate the results and you can look at these these are the, all the sentences that, that result from it and you can look at your naturally occurring text or the examples of this naturally occurring phenomena that you've elicited and make sure they're right uh, you can mouse over things and again like i said before you can see what rules were executed you can go to those rules you can set breakpoints if there are any problems and in this case we get exactly the same output that uh, was a list, a list that were listed uh, from our native speaker. Well, so that's that's that. Uh, now, here, since we're in Thailand, I wanted to give you another quick example uh, of a similar thing, and this is using noun classifiers in Thai. So the bottom line is here: you can't just say two eggs or two women. Each noun in Thai in Thai uh, has an associated classifier, and so you say Kai Song Luk versus Puying Song Kong. The classifiers are different based on the noun. And so it's a very simple example. You can set up in your lexicon, you can define the class and what class they belong to. You can do a very simple insertion rule. In this situation, uh, it'll insert the correct word. Uh, so for instance, Luke, Luke or Kong, and there are others. There's actually hundreds of these, but there, there are, is a, there's a smaller set of classifiers that can be used uh, as a first uh, first approximation, and then there's a very simple ordering rule that orders the classifier after adjective phrases. Again, it's a it's you know it's it's a fairly simple uh, uh, phenomena, but isn't everything once you understand it? And once you understand it, uh, you can uh, uh, 
usually come up with a reasonable rule to implement it. And that's what the LA visual lexicon, the, uh, the visual rule writing interface is all about. So conclusion, LA has been used to author thousands of lines of text in a wide variety of languages. Uh, let me just read this. LA is a language description methodology with built-in linguistic questionnaire that is the starting point and organizing principle from which the users describe the linguist surface forms of a language using LA's visual lexicon and grammatical rule development interface. It's a long sentence. And then finally, as we uh, exemplified in this paper, naturally occurring text and additional target phenomena can be added using the document authoring system as demonstrated by this inalienable, inalienable position of masculinity. So, thank you. It's been uh, nice having you as listeners.